Today is the Sunday of the prodigal son. This is one of the most beloved of parables, perhaps the most well-known of the gospel pericopes. The gospel reading has had such a profound effect on the history of the church that one bishop even went as far as to say that if all the scripture was to be lost and only this story was to remain, be enough for the church to continue. A father had two sons. The younger son came to the father and asked for his portion of the inheritance. This is something that isn't merely a matter of greed, but a matter of disregard for the Father. To say to your Father in this day and age, I want my inheritance, is to essentially say, Father, you are dead to me. Yet the Father gives to him his inheritance. He leaves behind his home and he goes into a distant country. And there he wastes away all that was given to him. The parable tells us that he joins himself to a man of that distant country. And the fathers of the church tell us that this means that he has become a servant, a slave to the evil one. And he's feeding these pigs. The pigs are the passions, those sins that we repeat again and again. But no matter how often we feed these passions, be it our gluttony, our lust, our anger, we remain unsatisfied. We hunger, as did this youngest son. We then hear that he comes to himself. And this is an interesting turn of phrase. But this, I think, is essential for each and every one of us. To stop and to see ourselves. To be present. So often we are scattered outside of ourselves. In our imagination. In our passions. Yet he comes to himself and he says to himself that even the servants of his father have enough bread to eat and then more. Here I think we are being told to turn to the lives of the saints, a theme that I repeat again and again, to read the lives of the saints, to see their icon. To behold these people who have been nourished by the grace of the Holy Spirit. In those lives of the saints, you will find no better example of courage, of faith, of joy. The lives of the saints are so entirely inclusive, you can find almost anyone there. What I mean by that, today for example... St. Christos, the gardener. The worms are eating your cabbage. Call on St. Christos. But more than this, we're to find saints in our lives that we come to know. Not just through their stories, through their words, or through their icons. But through a continual prayer and dialogue of calling upon them. Seeing those who lived in this freedom of his father's house, he decides that he will return. He says to himself, I will go to my father and I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am unworthy to be called your son. Rather, number me among your hired servants. He leaves that far country And while he's still a long distance away, the father sees him. 
and runs out to him and embraces him and kisses him. Something very profound here. The father was waiting, the father was watching, the father was hoping. And then, after he's embraced, after the father kisses him, he says to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm unworthy to be called your son. Here, I think, is a very important point for us. You see, the father had already embraced this youngest son before a single word exited his mouth. He was embraced and kissed as only a son is. And yet he still confessed. He still said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm unworthy to be called your son. And here I believe we are taught why it is not just important, but necessary for us to confess, to go to confession. You see, the son was loved by the father. Going to confession is not a way to win the love and affection of God. The God who let his son die for us even though we were still in the midst of our sins. But you see, if the son had not confessed, if he had not opened up, if he had not let go, that embrace and every subsequent embrace would have been a pain and an agony. He would have carried it around with him. He needed to let go of it. He needed to open up. He needed to stand before his father in all of his sinfulness. And the father responds, this my son was dead and now he lives. He was lost and now he is found. He places a robe upon his shoulders, a ring on his right hand. He calls for the fatted calf to be killed that they might feast and celebrate. A little later on, we hear of the older son. While all the celebration is going along, the feasting, the joy of the return of the prodigal, the older son is stewing outside, out in the dark and the cold, refusing to come in. His father goes to him. And the son, he attacks his brother. He said, I'm the good son. You haven't even given me a goat, but this your son who wasted his money, your money, on harlots. For him you kill the fatted calf. The father says, my son, you had me. You had me. The real realization of the prodigal wasn't that he was hungry for food, that all those passions leave us empty, but he was hungry to be in the presence of his father. This is the desire of each and every one of us, to draw near to Christ our God. The son refuses to go in. The story is somewhat open-ended. Some of the fathers of the church say that he remained there in that outer darkness, never to enter into that feast of the kingdom. Others, like St. Romanos, tell us that how could that older son, upon hearing the love of the father, not enter in with him? What is it? What is it that kept that older son from entering either initially or forever? And the answer to that 
my friends, is pride. Pilaftia, that self-love. No matter how righteous he may have been, he believed that he had earned, that he deserved. The prodigal son realized that apart from his father, he is nothing. Apart from Christ, we are nothing. There's a story that I will conclude with, one that I'm sure there's a few here that are familiar with. Bonus points to whoever can tell me where the story is from. The story begins with the kingdom having come. And all the saints and all the righteous are feasting and celebrating in the kingdom of the heavens. And Christ turns to his mother and he sees that she's downcast. And he asks her mother, the kingdom has come, the dead have been raised, the gates of paradise have been opened, and yet you mourn. And his mother turns to his, her son and says, my son, I mourn for those who are not here, those who are not feasting, those who are not enjoying the light of your face. And Christ, who once at the behest of his mother changed water to wine, said to his mother, Go then, go then to those broken gates of Hades and call all the sinners to enter into the kingdom the adulterers, the liars, the drunkards, the cheats. And she went and she went to the sinners. And there was never a more glorious entrance than when all of them entered into the kingdom. The feasting continued and Christ turned to his mother and again he saw that she was sorrowful. And he said, my mother, why now do you sorrow? And she says, there are those who chose not to follow me. There are those that chose to remain in hell. And Christ says to her, my mother, those are the proud. Those are the people who rather remain in hell for eternity than to be seen entering into the kingdom with all of the sinners. May Christ our God and his heavenly Father give us the grace to come to ourselves, to call upon him, to see our own need for him, and to save us from the pride of the other son. Amen.